Okay, uh, I think we can start. Uh, so, my name is Rafał Kowalski and today I'm going to talk about uh, reactive service-to-service -service communication with AirSocket. Before we start, a few announcements. Uh, the first one, we're going to use the slido.com during this presentation, so just go to this website, type Geekon 2019, find the room and pose your question. Uh, if you don't like this, uh, just shove your question, I will hope, uh, I will do my best to answer those questions. Um, I work at GrayPub, I'm cloud solution architect. Uh, we're doing some fancy stuff with IoT and cloud, and we're gonna talk about it today. Um, besides of that, um, I'm a PhD student at Institute of uh, Nuclear Physics, so all my professional as well as scientific career is uh, related to cloud computing and data processing. Okay, first question. Have you ever heard about the uh, AirSocket? Please raise your hands. Wow, cool. Uh, okay, so for those who uh, didn't hear about it, uh, no worries, we're gonna do the introduction to the protocol, so um, I hope you'll get, uh, you'll have some takeaways. Uh, and the second question is kind of obvious. Are you working with microservices on a daily basis? Wow. That's what I expected. So, because microservices are everywhere, literally everywhere, we went through this journey starting from monolithic applications, uh, which we struggled to deploy, to maintain. And at some point, we decided to split it to small components, connect them with some ESB or whatever. But it doesn't work very well, so then we realized that maybe we can remove this constraint and just let the services that connect together the way they would like to connect. And this architecture design has a lot of benefits and probably you are aware of them. Uh, today I would like to focus more on the drawbacks of such design. So the first drawback is that you are not delivering the business value directly to the client. So let's assume that you're working in, in the team which is responsible for small component in your system. And uh, you've got the ticket, you implemented a new feature, but it does not necessarily mean that this feature will be enabled to the end customer because you rely on the data which comes from the other services, as well as you may need to call other services to gather this data. <coughs> so. Here we might then, I we have an issue uh, that we need to communicate a lot and such distributed architecture, decoupled architecture, introduce the extra latency which would like to reduce. Especially that might be the issue if we are running in the cloud. And probably we do so because it's the same case like with microservices, the cloud is almost everywhere. Uh, it has a lot of benefits to running in the cloud. Thanks to containerization, we are able to deploy it quickly. Uh, but we have a risk of networking. So networking is a kind of first-class citizen uh, in the cloud. It need to be stable. It need to be uh, reliable. Other way, otherwise, we're going to struggle with many problems, many issues. OK, so let's um, dive a deep a little deeper in this concept of microservices, cloud, data, and communication. Let's assume that we are working on some, I don't know, payment system. Let it be payment system. Uh, we've got some uh, front end where the customers can interact with our system. Uh, we support some mobile apps, so uh, you can visit the payment system through the mobile app. And because we are a fancy company, we are doing some IoT stuff, so Mm, or fridge can pay for uh, for your snacks. How we can approach such system? First of all, um, probably we're gonna choose the um, the, s the cloud provider. We we can work on AWS. We can work on GCP Azure, whatever we would like to use. Hopefully, on top of that, uh, we are running some platform like Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, or or Cloud Booster, which pack them together. Mm, and that's cool. On top of that, we 
build our system. So it consists of multiple services, uh, most of them are built in Java or other JVM uh, language. We've got some Node.js, we've got some Python because we are doing uh, some machine learning. And here's the question. What's wrong with this design? Any ideas? Come on, guys. Okay, so uh, here we've got two issues. Uh, the first one is that we connected them with some with HTTP based on some RESTful APIs. So we've got the RESTful APIs everywhere. It works well, but this request response model is not suitable in every single business usage. Of course, we can make some workarounds and it still will work, but then we're gonna face another issue. If we have a lot of uh, traffic, we'll notice that, okay, uh, we are running out of memory, but our CPUs are almost idle. So it's the usage is like 10% while we need the two gigabytes of memory to uh, to run this, uh, this the single microservice. And it happens because HTTP is a blocking protocol, so uh, it works in the model where we've got that thread per request, and it's extremely inefficient. So after some time, we realize, okay, this HTTP doesn't work well for us. Maybe we can change something. So we replace uh, this HTTP and RESTful APIs in few places. We introduce some uh, gRPC. Uh, we switched to HTTP2 and implemented some uh, reactive uh, operations using um, uh, web flags or whatever. And we've got some messaging to just pass the messages through the system. And it's okay, but we are still reinventing the wheel. We need to implement the authentication and other stuff for all those protocols. What if I tell you that you can replace all this communication with just one protocol which will fulfill all your requirements. And it's called AirSocket. Mm, it's fueled by uh, Facebook, Google, and Pivotal, so it has a huge enterprise uh, support. It was announced last year uh, during the Spring One conference by, but by Ben Hale, uh, who is a Java lead for Cloud Foundry. And he described it this way. So AirSocket is a bi-directional, multiplexed, message-based, binary protocol based on reactive streams, back pressure, and four elements interaction model. That was a long sentence, uh, but I did it on purpose. We've got a lot of adjectives here. Uh, so today we're gonna tackle them uh, piece by piece and dive deeper into, into details of this protocol. So let's tackle the first bit. Um, it's frame message based binary protocol. Uh, the communication in AirSocket is split into frames. So we, every message we pass using this protocol is packed into frame. So it's framed. And um, the second thing is that for single source and single receiver, um, frame die order. So let's assume that you emit the event, the message A and B, and it's assured by AirSocket that they will, uh, they will reach the receiver in the same order. Um, in the protocol, we've got around 20 or 21 uh, different frames for different operations. Uh, most of them are related to um, interaction model, I will discuss later, uh, and the rest of them are to some specific action uh, actions which are available in this protocol. Uh, the very unique is a setup frame. Um, the setup frame might be used for example authentication, so you can customize the, the payload you, you sent during the connection initialization. So that's the very beginning. At the very beginning, when the connection is established, the setup frame is sent from the client to the server. And the protocol itself is not uh, readable by humans. It's binary. It's very efficient in machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communications, but there's no more JSON or XMLs flying by. Of course, you can 
uh, have a JSON or XML uh, on the client side, on the receiver side, uh, you just serialize it and transfer it through the uh, using this protocol. Uh, but AirSocket deal with it like a bag of bits. So it's just serialize, transfer, deserialize. Uh, and it can, it can handle even large payloads. So you can imagine that you need to transfer an image or, or some document through the network. Let's say it's, it, it's 25 megabytes. No, no worries, the AirSocket support the fragmentation. So it will automatically divide mm, your payload into into frames, uh, which is technically done by putting a flag in your payload. This flag indicates that there will be more parts of the same payload. Okay, so we tackled the first bit. The second is um, multiplexing. So multiplexing um, in AirSocket is done the same way as it is in HTTP2. Uh, so for every si single physical connection, we creating a, a logical connection, which are called streams. And you may have many streams. Uh, you need to give them the unique IDs. Uh, it's on the receiver side, that the, sorry, it's on the side which initiate the connection between two components to set the mm, stream ID. Uh, zero is revert for some uh, actions related to setting up the connection, canceling, keeping it alive. <coughs> okay, and of course the uh, protocol is bidirectional. Uh, so there is a one part that the, the client is responsible for initialization of connection, uh, sending the setup frame. And after that, AirSocket um, does not differentiate between the client and server. So we can pass data back and forth as you wish. It provides uh, building peer-to-peer -peer communication. So if you're doing some uh, IoT stuff and you'd like to, I don't know, connect your phone with your fridge directly, uh, you can do it without any uh, proxy, any uh, cloud. Okay, and it's based on reactive stream and uh, has a support board for back pressure. Uh, so AirSocket can massively use uh, reactive stream uh, specification as uh, project reactor. So you've got the mono flexes, you've got the support for all the signals like on next, on uh, on cancel, subscribe and so on. So it's fully reactive. And like I mentioned, it supports the back pressure mechanism. So it, it might be very useful um, <coughs> in the real cases when you deal with a lot of uh, traffic. So as a client who requests the stream from other side, uh, I might say how many messages I would like to consume. So uh, if I'm dealing with some uh, latency problems, I can just say, okay, give me two messages. I will process them and let you know when I need some more. So you've got this back pressure uh, mechanism built in. And last but not least is the four elements interaction model. Um, here we've got the fire and forget, which is uh, very useful when you'd like to just send a notification or, uh, I don't know, send an email or whatever, just fire and forget. We don't care about the responses from the other side. Uh, we've got the request response um, interaction model, which mimics the, the HTTP communication. So, so we can also do that uh, as well as we've got the request stream. So as a, a client, for example, I initiate the connection, uh, I send the request stream to the server and the server will stream me uh, data. And we've got the support for uh, both way communication so both sides can stream uh, data as they wish. Okay, so let's dive to short demo. Uh, I will show you how it looks like on the API level. Let me clone the my screen. Okay, 
can you see it? Oh, it's big enough. Okay, so on the left hand side, we've got the uh, very simple implementation of the server side. Uh, we've got a very simple uh, factory uh, which provides the, mm, the air sockets. So here we've got the factory we call just metal receive. Uh, and then what we need to uh, implement is acceptor. So it's a part of this API which deals with all the incoming uh, messages. So it's based on uh, air socket interface. We've got the, all the mm, methods, definition of the methods which we need to implement to, uh, to interact in all possible ways. So we've got the uh, fire and forget, request response, request stream, request channel, and some metadata push which is uh, might be use can be useful when we would like to push the notification, for example, to the mobile device. So there's no data, we're just pushing some uh, headers or whatever we would like to, to do. Okay, so we need to implement this um, interface. Uh, there is uh, some basic implementation provided which does not support any operations, so we just can extend it and implement the way we would like to uh, interact with our sockets. It's a very simple logic. Uh, here we're just uh, passing by some uh, string messages with hello words and so on. Uh, the second part here is uh, transport. We need to define the transport in our protocol because our socket is kind of an abstraction of on TCP, WebSocket and Iron. So the three transportation layers are supported. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use the plain TCP. Uh, we just specify the connection. Today we're gonna connect on localhost 7000, whatever, and we're doing some blocking to just be able to keep it uh, running. Okay, so the logic here is extremely simple and is extremely simple on the client side because we're using the same components. We're just calling the, uh, the factory uh, to connect to given um, socket. Uh, we specified the sorry we specified the, uh, the transport and then we can invoke the method. There's one more thing I would like to mention. It's related to the setup payload. Uh, as you can see during the initialization of connection, you can specify uh, the setup payload, uh, pass some credentials or or other stuff. And to do that during the connection, I can specify the setup frame. So the API here is kind of low level, but uh, still very uh, convenient to use. Okay, so let me spin the, the server and we're gonna discuss the frames. <coughs> so uh, we've got the server and we have, uh, we invoke the fire and forget method, probably. Do they demo, they say? <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, oh, what's wrong here? Oh, sorry. Stop it. That's the whole example. Okay. Bound it to a new server. The port 7000. Fire and forget. Oh, I don't know what's going wrong. Uh, maybe we can just switch to uh, request response example. Let me check one more thing. Ah. So my ports were blocked. Oh, yeah, we got it. Okay, so uh, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, we're just uh, sending the fire and forget request with some metadata included. That's the, uh, the first frame. Uh, you can see some uh, hexadecimal representation of this. And then you've got the, <coughs> you've got the, mm, the payload. Uh, of this message. On the server side, the very first at the very beginning, we just send a setup frame. Uh, so that's the part related to uh, connection initialization and you can customize it of course. And 
set again through through the yeah. So we receive some payload during the connection initialization. Uh, nothing exciting here. Uh, maybe let's uh, move to to request response model, which, uh, like I said, mimics the uh, behavior of uh, of HTTP. So we can easily. Uh, mimic this behavior. As you can see, here we've got a different type of frame. In previous case, it was uh, request, fire and forget. Here we've got the frame uh, request uh, response. And again, in this case, we passing some kick on 2019. And in the response, uh, we've got some hello world uh, from the backend side. Uh, it's automatically mm, <coughs> This relies on the other end, and here we've got the next type of the frame, which is uh, next complete, which indicates to the uh, uh, to the consumer of this uh, of this message that uh, we'll we we are done with transferring the data. So we are able to easily uh, mimic the mimic the behavior of uh, HTTP, as well as we can stream some data. So in this case, we requesting a stream uh, from the server side. We limited those requests to just five. So after five requests, as you can see in the bottom, uh, the client automatically sends the cancel frame. And that's the cool feature from which is built in, in the Earth socket that you can immediately cut your stream, uh, which in other protocols sometimes might be, might be difficult to gracefully uh, kill all stream of data, and the next thing I would like you to show is a pack pressure mechanism support. So again, uh, we've got a very simple implementation <coughs> of the uh, request stream. So um, we define that, uh, okay, we're gonna uh, request the stream from the server side and we implement the subscriber, uh, which works very in very simple way, so uh, every two messages I'm requesting another two. So at the beginning I'm requesting two messages, and then when I deal with those messages I'm requesting another two. Okay, let me clear this one and this one, and let's see how it works. Okay, so a few messages went through the stream. I'll just stop it to just show you the logs, uh, how, how it looks on the uh, log level, the signals we are sending and doing it automatically. Uh, so we've got uh, some on next method. Uh, we dealt with two messages and then we sending another request to stream two messages. So this mechanism might be very useful when we are dealing with huge streams of data, like I mentioned. So when the uh, we are implementing the receiver side and the server is streaming a lot of data, uh, to us, we are not able to deal with uh, all these uh, informations. Uh, we can just limit um, how it sends the events and process them one by one. Okay, so that was a short demo of the API, how it looks like. Let's go back to, to the presentation. But the question is, is it enough in the cloud? So I showed you very basic operations uh, using AirSocket, uh, no rocket science here, but AirSocket provides some more features which might be considered very uh, useful, especially if you are working in the cloud. So the first feature is uh, load balancing. Here in this case, AirSocket relies on client load balancing. So we've got the tiny container as a, we've got a class which works as a container which uh, puts all the connections uh, in one place. So when you interact the, with the API, you interact with this uh, container and invoke the methods uh, on this container. and AirSocket will mat automatically load balance and choose the proper AirSocket uh, which it might use. Uh, it supports the um, integration integration with uh, service discovery, uh, for example, with Eureka, so you can pull the uh, data 
how to connect the particular socket uh, from from Eureka. Uh, the console, as far as I know, console is not supported yet. The second feature, which might be useful, especially when you're working with some uh, big data solutions, uh, is uh, metadata in frames support. So the metadata can be anything. You can put whatever you want there. Uh, so, for example, you can put some, I don't know, the Avro schema. And on the receiver side, you can firstly read this metadata, extract it, and then you will know how to deal with the payload itself. So this mechanism might be mm, very useful. You don't need to know what kind of data you are working with. You just read the, uh, the metadata, and then you are able to serialize uh, the payload. And the last but not least feature uh, is possibility to resume the stream. And in my opinion, it's kind of killer here. Uh, so it works this way that if you are streaming data, for example, from, from server to the client, and at some point your connection is broken, you, I don't know, your phone is switching the, from Wi-Fi to uh, to GPRS or, or whatever, you, you've got this gap in the connection, AirSocket will automatically cache your frames and when the socket, the receiver, will be available again, it will push it. It works this way that mm, you've got the token mechanism, so every single part of this connection, so the server as a client and the client as well, uh, they track the position of the stream and if they don't receive the acknowledge that the message was delivered, the, the next messages are cached again. So when the connection comes becomes available, uh, they will compare the tokens uh, and we'll see how much data they need uh, to process to, um, let's say, keep up with the incoming stream. And on the API uh, level, uh, it's very, it's very, it's very clear. Uh, you, you, what we need to do is to just put the resume uh, flag to just turn on this uh, functionality, and you need to provide the resume store. The very basic implementation is to just cache them inside the memory, uh, which is it's not very useful. Maybe you can easily implement. Uh, some other caching mechanism, so you can put your uh, data in, uh, in Redis or other place whenever you you like to to do this. Okay, so what I showed you uh, is kind of low-level API, but it's not that hard to work with it. But still, if you feel uncomfortable and you would like to have some uh, level of abstraction on top of that. Uh, there is a RPC uh, library called AirSocket RPC. <laughs> That's obvious. Uh, and uh, it provides the functionality to just call the RPC uh, method. It uh, supports the protobuf code generation, so uh, you can work with it exactly the same you work with your gRPC. Uh, so in this case, you uh, treat the AirSocket more like a way to call the remote procedures. Uh, but also you've got the Spring Reactor support, uh, which uh, in this case you can work with uh, using AirSocket with the messages. So you treat your AirSocket as a way to transport um, messages. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to uh, take a look at Spring Boot 2.2 and to visit the uh, Spring tips from Josh Long. Uh, it was released like one week ago. Uh, he went through the all new features in Reactor, which support the <coughs> support the uh, Air Socket. So I strongly encourage you to um, visit this uh, this place and see what's going on. I don't want to show it today. We don't have enough time for that. Uh, okay, so just to uh, sum up this uh, bit, the uh, Air Socket. Uh, like I said, it's a bidirectional, multiplex, message-based protocol. Uh, it's binary, so it's not human 
uh, readable. That's the main uh, takeaway uh, from uh, from this talk. Uh, it's fully reactive, so it support all the features we would like to uh, use uh, to reduce and to, to, to reduce the memory and thread usage and make our applications more robust. It, provide the, it provides the rich interaction model. Uh, so we've got those four methods, fire and forget, request response, request stream, and channel where we can stream data uh, back and forth. Uh, it's flexible in terms of uh, transport, payload, uh, and language. So it has uh, support for multiple languages. You can just go visit the the website and see how many languages it supports. Uh, I personally have an experience only with uh, with Java, working with AirSocket. I never tried with other languages, but uh, as I notice, it's still under development. The current version is 0 0.12, so it's uh, not even the major one. Uh, the protocol itself is uh, under hard uh, development. So. To be honest, I don't recommend it to use in a production right now. Um, maybe we need to just wait a few months or contribute and uh, implement the features which are not implemented yet. Uh, but for, for POC projects where we would like to check some uh, communications uh, between cloud and devices, I strongly encourage you to test it, uh, mainly because of this uh, resume uh, feature which is very important in this case. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, that's it. You can reach me on Twitter and uh, on uh, GitHub. Uh, I'm waiting for questions, if you have some. I will check there. Okay, uh, so have you ever measured how much performance gain on a socket on your use case? Uh, of it works over TCP is the gain only on the payload side. Uh, yeah, so the gain is uh, mainly on the payload side because it works on um, it works on TCP, of course. So it's not the uh, most efficient protocol ever. Uh, if you need uh, to to work with some, especially if you're working in IoT. If you need to work with some uh, faster protocols, so then UDP will always uh, kill TCP in terms of performance. Uh, the main mm, way to uh, improve the performance here, the gain is on reactive, uh, reactive side, so we are fully reactive. Uh, yeah, that's that's the main, and uh, and of course, of payload, like I mentioned before, and. The next, what about testing a socket? Well, the question is coming up. Okay, so uh, could you explain why not HTTP2 nor Quick? Uh, I'm not saying no. I'm just trying to find the way to unify the connection. So it's not that, uh, like, uh, don't use the HTTP2, use a socket. Uh, it's more like if you struggle with multiple protocols to transfer your data and you feel that you're still reinventing the well, you need to deal with uh, all the stuff related to uh, those different protocols, then I recommend you to use AirSocket. And the next question is, what about the disadvantage disadvantages of AirSocket solution? Uh, so it's not a mature uh, solution. That's the main advantage. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it's fueled by Facebook, Google, and Pivot, also big fishes and are inside uh, this protocol. But uh, I didn't find any examples how they use it in production. And like I mentioned, the current version is 0 0.2. Uh, so it's not even the major one. I would wait a bit to use it, uh, to use it on production, uh, but I think it's something you can keep eye on to see how it develops. Maybe you you will get extremely excited about it and and contribute, mm, put some put some uh, effort and develop some features on this. <coughs> uh, could AirSocket work on SSL TLS? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically. Uh, 
during the, I mean, the setup procedure um, in AirSocket works like, it's called TLS false start. So it, it's, first of all, it's uh, of course support the TLS. And the second one is that this setup frame needs to have to be sent at the very beginning of the communication. Otherwise, uh, the communication will drop. So uh, can I use UDP as a transport layer? Uh, nope. The answer is no. Uh, can you tell us more about performance resource? Uh, can you tell us more about performance resource uh, consumption comparison against HDP G? RPC and others. Uh, so uh, we did a comparison uh, between uh, HTTP and uh, AirSocket, and in its terms, of course, is AirSocket is is killing, uh, but mainly because of uh, uh, the way how it dealt with threats. So and the n here we've got the benefits of non-blocking interaction. Uh, we didn't compare it with uh, with HTTP2, but I assume that the result here will be almost the same because uh, those protocols are familiar, so uh, similar to each other. Uh, so I would like to mention it again. So a socket is not the mm, solution you would like to compare with others in terms of this one is better than other one. No, it more like unifying the communication, uh, how you how you do the communication, you know, microservices. Okay, I think we can tackle one more. Uh, does this protocol support body compress out of the box? Uh, I don't know uh, what you mean about body compress in this case? Uh, of course, it's uh, tran uh, seri serialized and deserialized it uh, from and to uh, bytes. So that's of course kind of compression of uh, payload. But uh, I don't know if it's uh, supported. I didn't find any any um, information about uh, compressing the the payload. Never done such things. And are the presented examples on GitHub? Uh, not yet, I will just post them after the conference, but you can find the, uh, the same, almost the same examples, which shows the interaction model uh, on the official RS socket site. So uh, I strongly encourage you to, to visit this one. Okay, any other questions? Someone would like to shout it? Oh. Sorry? Message, message integrity. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry. Uh, so for that, we... Uh, I, I didn't investigate, to be honest. Uh, I didn't investigate the security uh, very well. I, I worked in, uh, during the POC project uh, for IoT platform using this using this protocol, uh, but uh, out of the box, you've got the support for TLS and SSL. So I mean that in these terms, you, you, you have kind of, uh, you can assure that your message integrity will be, uh, will be provided, will be uh, provided by your socket. So I hope it uh, answer your question. Okay, so Thank you very much. Uh, once again, I strongly encourage you to visit the website of AirSocket and get familiar with it, play with it. Uh, it's really simple. Maybe you can adopt in in your projects. Thank you. <laughs>